The most difficult thing about splitting with your partner if you have children is wondering who they're going to be around. Will your ex bring dates around your child? Will they allow a partner to move in? Will your child have a step parent? These situations are fraught even under the best of circumstances. Even if you like the person your ex ends up with, they're still caring for your child and becoming a parental figure. So what happens when something happens to your child under their watch? On the morning of June 4th, 2010, seven-year-old Kyron Horman went to a science fair at his school with his stepmother, Terry Horman. They walked around, she took photos of him in front of his project, and she left as he set off for class. But Kyron never made it to class. And it wouldn't be until 3.30 that afternoon when Terry and Kyron's father, Kane, went to meet him at the bus stop that they would realize that he had been missing for the entire day. What follows is 10 years of a family's anguish and parents left wondering if letting Terry Horman into their son's life was the worst mistake they've ever made. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Kyron Horman. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Richard Horman was born on September 9, 2002 in Portland, Oregon to Desiree Young and Kane Horman. Desiree and Kane had married just two years earlier, but it wasn't exactly a match made in heaven. The pair basically decided that they had made a mistake and decided to separate shortly after they got married, but then Desiree found out she was pregnant. So, you know, they were buoyed by the thought of having a child, so they decided to give it another go. However, it seems as though their first instincts were right, um, because Desiree ended up filing for divorce while she was eight months pregnant. Yeah, I, well, I mean, it's that's not surprising. I mean, adding a child to an already stressful uh, relationship is definitely not going to make it any Easier? less stressful. Well, yeah. okay, yes. I mean, I agree with you. However, I mean, speaking as somebody who's given birth to two children and who is no longer with the father of her first child, um, I cannot imagine filing for divorce when I'm eight months pregnant. Like by eight months, I was so mentally fried that there's no way I would want to deal with a major life change or even the paperwork. Like none of that sounds like something I would want to do. So my first thought after I read this was that the relationship must have been, like, really bad. Um, but it doesn't appear that that was the case. I don't know. I feel like it uh, when you were eight months pregnant with our kid that you were probably done with me. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, and so. I like you. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, for sure. But, no, I still wouldn't have wanted to deal with the paperwork. <laughs> sure. But yeah, in in her divorce filing, like they just did irreconcilable differences. And according to friends and family, they remained on good terms after the split. So, I mean, it could just be a simple, like, it they did were not just work. not compatible. Yeah. yeah. Desiree and Kane shared custody of Chiron, but it wasn't 50 50. The child mostly lived with Desiree, um, but Kane was still very much involved in his son's life. But then in 2004, Desiree suffered from kidney failure, and her condition was so bad that she had to leave her toddler behind and go to Canada to seek treatment. Wow. Yeah. And so when she left, Kyron moved in with his dad full-time. Kane was obviously happy to have his son with him, because like I said, he was always involved. But, you know, logis the logistics that prevented him from having 50-50 custody of him before, like, certainly did yeah. not become easier <laughs> once he had 100% custody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a lot to, to take on. I mean, it, you know, it's a complete lifestyle change, and if yeah. you don't have the capacity to deal with that, you know, even on a 50-50 uh, split, like, 
I mean, I certainly understand that. Right. Well, yeah. and his and so Kane's issues were basically the same issues that you had, which was your job. job. Yeah. And you know, your schedule was, you know, a little bit crazier than his, but so Kane was an engineer for Intel mm. um at their near at their nearby Hillsborough campus and it was a demanding job that required long hours. Yeah, I mean, you know, your brother-in-law he's an engineer. Yeah. And or, yeah, like yeah, how, and my sister how often, is always very mad at him because yeah, he never comes home he at a reasonable never time. Comes home. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we see him passing our house more than she sees him. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and so yeah, like he got thrown into the situation and didn't know how to make it work. But luckily, one of Desiree's good friends, Terry, was around and willing to help. Hmm. Terry had known Desiree for years, and she was a divorced mother to his son, James, who was around eight at the time. So, you know, she had experience, like she understood kids, and she already knew, you know, Kane and Desiree. So she and James moved into Kane's home, and she became a live-in caregiver for Kyron. Wow. Yeah. Desiree returned to Portland two months after she went to Canada for treatment, but she came home to tens of thousands of dollars in medical bills and, you know, was presumably still ill. Like, yeah. I don't think she went to Canada and just was magically cured or anything yeah, like right, that. Right. Um, so she didn't try to regain custody of Kyron, uh, probably feeling as though Kane's home was, you know, just a more stable environment for him at the time. Even if she got solid treatment, which it sounds like she did, you have, you'd have to think that she'd be on some sort of dialysis or something. Yeah, you know, something. That would make, again, caring for a to toddler. For yeah. yeah. As the years went on, Desiree continued to share custody with her ex-husband. Terry continued to care for Kyron, and Desiree eventually married Medford Police Detective Tony Young. Everything seemed to be going fine, even when Kane and Terry began a romantic relationship. Hmm. The pair married in April of 2007. The next year, on December 8th, 2008, Terry gave birth to a baby girl, Kiara. And just a side note, you may have noticed a large number of K names, Kane, Kyron, Kiara. Um, that is because Kane's side of the family has a tradition of naming their children names that start with K. And as you know, my mother's side of the family has the same tradition, which is why my mom, all of her sisters, my sister, and I all have K names. And you didn't have a girl. I did not have a girl. <laughs> Anyway, Terry, Kane, James, Kyron, and Kiara seem to have a happy life with everyone adjusting well to the blended family dynamics. Terry was a big Facebook user and loved posting photos of their day-to-day -day life and adventures. Soon after they wed, Kane gifted her with a cherry red Mustang, which she posted with the caption, something shiny for the driveway. Yes, Kane is all that and a bag of chips. <laughs> She would also send photos of Kiara to everyone, including her first husband, Ron Tarver, who was like, uh, okay, cool. <laughs> like, he said they didn't really have that type of relationship, but it seems like Terry was just the type of mom who wanted to, everyone to be well aware of her baby's every move. Now, did they have any kind of tumultuous breakup that you... Oh, I mean, no, not really. I mean, they nothing, shared custody. Nothing of note. Yeah, just normal breakup stuff, it seems like. He had nice things to say about her, um, you know, said he, she was a good mom to their son, James. But anyway, so let's back up a little bit to when Terry first agreed to move in with Kane and care for Kyron. So she was Desiree's friend, but she also had a lot of experience with children beyond being a mom to James. Prior to moving in with Kane and after divorcing her second husband, Terry worked as a substitute teacher in the Hillsborough School District. She even held some long-term sub-jobs, which are typically harder to get. Hmm. So, and Terry apparently dreamed of being a school superintendent, and while she was caring for Kyron, she earned a master's in education from Pacific University in Forest Grove. So, I mean, I can see why both Kane and Desiree were comfortable with leaving Kyron in her care. She was someone who was interested in education, worked hard, and seemed to care about children. But even early on, it was evident that Terry wasn't perfect. In 2005, she was arrested for drunk driving while her son James was in the car. He was about 11 at the time. 
Terry was charged with a DUI and reckless child endangerment. She pled guilty and ended up taking a diversion course. Now, can you explain a little bit about what that means for somebody who may not know? Yeah, so any any kind of diversion program, uh, the idea behind it is for uh, first-time offenders uh, for nonviolent offenses to um, not actually face jail time. Uh, there is some punitive elements to it, so they, they might have to take uh, certain courses depending on what, uh, what the county courses are offered. Um, but the idea behind it is to, to limit the amount of people that are going to jail. Okay. So they basically, that's the thing where they take the class and right. yeah, don't have to go to jail. Exactly. Okay. And the arrest seemed to be a one-time mistake. Terry quickly put it behind her. After she and Kane were married, the family did normal family things. They went to Disney World, they visited the zoo, they had game nights, all of which she documented on her Facebook page. Years went on with Kane and Terry seemingly living a happy life with James, Kyron, and Kiara. Terry loved being a mom and volunteered at Kyron's elementary school. The family was so close that many people didn't even realize that Kyron was Terry's stepson. But in early 2010, some fissures started to appear in their happy family. According to an article in the Oregonian, Terry's oldest son, James, who was 16 at the time, was sent away in March of that year. Now, no reason is given, but James first went to live with his grandparents in Roseburg, Oregon, about two and a half hours away from Portland. He then went to live with his father, Ron Tarver. Presumably, there was a rough patch that led up to this change, but whatever preceded James moving out of the home, it was nothing compared to what was about to happen. On June 4th, 2010, seven-year-old Kyron was participating in a science fair at his school, Skyline Elementary. Terry brought him to school shortly after 8 a.m., and the pair walked around the fair looking at exhibits. Terry took a photo of Kyron in front of his project about the red-eyed tree frog, A student reported seeing Kyron near the school's south entrance at around 9 a.m. Terry told investigators that she left the school and saw Kyron walking toward his class. So we have a witness. You said a student saw Mm -hmm. him. And yes, yes, at the south entrance. And later, other people would claim to have seen him actually outside of the school. Despite the fact that Kyron's homeroom teacher marked him as absent, Terry and Kane say that they never received a call from the school alerting them that he hadn't made it to class. So that's why at 3.30, they went to the bus stop as normal, expecting Kyron to get off just like he had every other day. But Kyron didn't get off the bus. Frantic calls are immediately made, and at 3.46 p.m., Susan Hall, the school secretary, called 911 and reported Kyron missing. What time was that? 3.46 p.m. And what time was he supposed to get off of his bus? 3.30. Oh. So it was like 15 minutes of like, you know, people calling back Panic. and forth, like figuring mm-hmm. out where he was. They realized nobody did know where he was. And so the school secretary called 911. That's pretty fast. That's pretty quick thinking. Well, yeah, it is. It's quick thinking, but he also hasn't been seen since 9 a.m. So we're talking a huge period of time. Right. Despite the fact that Kyron was only seven, and like I said, he hadn't been seen since 9 a.m., it took police 45 minutes to respond. Officers from the Portland Police Bureau and the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office both responded to the school in the Horman's home. According to a timeline published by the Oregonian, an automated message went out to Skyline Elementary parents that said, quote, Kyron Horman did not arrive at home today. It seemed like police spent time interviewing the Hormans and school officials because a formal missing person search isn't announced until 7 p.m. And it isn't until after 8 p.m. that the first search teams arrive at Skyline. Yeah, I mean, that seems late. Yeah, that seems late. This kid's been missing for 11 hours. Are you kidding me? But I'm also going to, again, give the benefit of of the doubt to the police department. So, you know, initial investigations as far as a missing child go, you want to get that grasp of the totality of the family unit. Yes. um, As well as interviewing anybody and everybody that could possibly have seen the child last. Yeah, no, of course. Yes. To kind of set up the overall arching day. And he has been missing for 11 hours. Right. 
That's a long time. Yeah. I feel like have people do some interviews and have other people like look into the fields. We don't know the size of this police department. We don't know what their capabilities are. I mean, this is in Portland. It's a city. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But in their defense, things do start to happen pretty quickly after this point. By the end of the first day, local media had been alerted and Mountain Wave, which is an emergency communication and search and rescue group, had arrived to offer assistance. The groups completed searches of the Horman home, Skyline Elementary, and surrounding outbuildings and land. And then the next morning, another search group, Pacific Northwest Search and Rescue, joined as news of the missing boy spread. An alert was sent out to the Associated Press, and a UK-based missing children organization set up a website and a hotline for information related to Kyron's disappearance. That afternoon, the sheriff's office said they weren't yet treating this as a kidnapping case, but that Kyron was considered an endangered missing person. Both the National Guard and the FBI's Rapid Response Unit joined the search, but by the time Saturday ended, there was no trace of the boy. By Sunday morning... Terry was being proactive, posting on Facebook, quote, I ordered 1,000 flyers. They will be coming to our house. I will let people know when they are here and we can go from there. Thank you, everyone. End quote. Detectives who weren't physically searching for Kyron were at the elementary school interviewing around 300 parents and students who were present on Friday to see if any of them had any information about where Kyron had gone and how this little boy seemingly vanished into thin air. On Monday, classes at Skyline Elementary School resumed with counselors on hand, and the search for Chiron continued. So part of the problem that searchers were running into is that Chiron School is located on the edge of hundreds of acres of thick rainforest. Mm -hmm. And I'll put a picture on the blog so people can see, but yeah, I... I, you know, I'm not familiar with the Pacific Northwest. I've never been to no, Oregon. Am I. I mean, I know they have all the trees and whatnot, but like there's an aerial picture that is crazy because it's just his school and then forest. Yeah. So vast area, dense woods, mm-hmm. very difficult to search in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So whether somebody took him or he walked away of his own accord, it would have been easy for him to quickly end up in a place where he would be very hard to find. Portland Mountain Rescue was brought in and the large scale search for Chiron continued throughout the week. But on June 13th, nine days after the seven year old vanished from school, the sheriff's office announced that they were ending the search which was one of the largest in state history and included over 1,300 volunteers from Oregon, Washington, and California. Kyron's disappearance was now becoming a criminal investigation. So when I say ending the search, like they weren't giving up, they weren't stopping, but they were scaling back because they thought by nine days later, they were no longer looking for a little boy who walked away from school. Right. And we also aren't privy to the details of the investigation. So maybe they got something that led them to believe uh, that this was not just a kid that walked away. Yeah, there was a lot going on. During the week that followed, 30 billboards were put up with Kyron's face and information. Dive teams searched local bodies of water and Kyron's family was interviewed. Terry was given a polygraph exam and was supposed to take a second one on June 19th. By June 25th, Kyron's parents, Desiree and Kane, were making the rounds on morning shows to draw attention to Kyron's case. So this case got national attention almost immediately. While it was just the two of them, Kyron's step-parents also remained front and center, with the four of them appearing together at local news conferences and other events. But it wouldn't be long before that unified front started to crumble. So the next day, on June 26th, the day after Kane and Desiree were on the morning shows, two 911 calls were placed from Kane and Terry's home. And I couldn't find contemporaneous specific information about them, although I did find out um, several years later that the calls actually came from Terry. But at the time, the sheriff's office, you know, obviously didn't want to say much about them. The only saying that the first one was, quote, a threat, and that the second one was related to child custody issues. Mm. That night, Kane Horman left the family home with his 
19-month-old daughter, Kiara. So this happened on a Saturday. And by Monday, Kane was in court filing for divorce from Terry. Oh, wow. Yeah. The court papers cited irreconcilable differences, but he didn't just file divorce papers. He filed an emergency restraining order against Terry. Now, I luckily don't know much about emergency restraining orders, but according to FBI profiler Brad Garrett, in order to get one, Kane would have had to have made the case that his wife posed an immediate threat to him or their 18-month-old daughter. And this restraining order prevented Terry from having contact with either Kiara or her 16-year-old son, James. And Kane also asked for sole custody of Kiara. Wow. So obviously something really terrible happened. Yeah. And I just want to reiterate that things in the Horman household appear to fall apart very quickly. On June 25th, just the day before, when Desiree and Kane were on Good Morning America, she did not give any indication that she was suspicious in anyone in Kyron's life, saying, quote, Honestly, it's a parent's worst nightmare. We've racked our brains trying to think of reasons why. We cannot come up with anything. It's like a portal opened up in the school and Kyron just vanished into it. It's a mystery. End quote. Terry said this? No, this is what Desiree said hmm. on Good Morning America. So like the day before, Kane left the house People were calling 911. I mean, you know, Desiree went on Good Morning America and said, yeah, I have no idea what could have happened to him. So she didn't suspect Terry at the time, seemingly. Right. But soon it would seem that Desiree would come to a very different conclusion. Later that same day that Kane filed for divorce, Monday, June 26th, Desiree, her husband, Tony, and Kane released a joint statement saying that they were all cooperating with police and they didn't mention Terry. That's after Terry was confronted by reporters about Kane and Kiara moving out and she said, quote, everything's good. We heard that rumor. It's just a rumor that needs to be squelched. Everything's fine, end quote. So like clearly the other three are already not having it and they made it perfectly clear that she was no longer a part of this. Yeah, my initial thought with with everything is, you know, let's not jump to conclusions here because this is a, a tremendous amount of of stress and it could be triggering who knows All sorts of what things, for sure. Yeah, but this is not going down a good road. Oh yeah, no, for sure. And by July 4th, all hell breaks loose. In an effort to interview everyone who could have had contact with Kyron in the days and weeks leading up to his disappearance, investigators speak with a landscaper who worked at the Horman home. Now, their interest is immediately piqued because apparently Kane didn't know about this landscaper. He was hired by Terry. But then when they interview him, things get completely crazy. According to this landscaper, Terry offered him a large sum of money to kill her husband Six to seven months before Kyron disappeared. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like the whole quick divorce restraining order thing, you know, is starting to become a little bit clearer at this point. And so police definitely tried to use this. Um, on June 26th, they recorded a conversation between Terry and the landscaper, but she shut it down right away and they didn't get anything useful. It's very specific. It's, it doesn't sound like something that this landscaper would necessarily like come up with on his own. You know what I mean? Right. And, but Terry does have her side of the story to, to that, which I'll get to later. Um, but you know, as July, 2010 rolls along, things just start looking worse and worse for Terry with the legal troubles and the pending divorce. People stop looking at her as a grieving parent and start looking at her like the main suspect in Kyron's disappearance. While police do not formally name Terry as a suspect or even as a person of interest, they do start digging into her life and whereabouts a bit more. And it's at this point that at least two witnesses come forward and say that they saw an adult waiting in Terry's truck while Terry was inside the school with Kyron. Hmm. 
Police, you know, obviously want to know who this person is because he or she could have answers about what happened to Kyron after 9 a.m. on June 4th. And one name quickly emerges, Dee Dee Spiker. Dee Dee is one of Terry's close friends, and while she claimed she was on a gardening job that morning, her employers say they were not able to reach her for several hours that day. And Desiree and Kane immediately went public with their belief that Dee Dee knew what happened to Kyron, releasing a statement that said in part, quote, she has not only been in close communication with Terry, but has been providing Terry with support and advice that is not in the best interests of our son, end quote. And there's no arguing that the women were close. Dee Dee moved in with Terry after Kane filed for divorce and took their daughter. And she stayed there in the house until a judge ordered Terry to evacuate the home so Kane and Kiara could move back in. Investigators wanted to know more about Dee Dee. And so they searched her condo, her aunt's house where she had been known to stay, and her place of employment, but apparently turned up nothing. And things just get crazier from here. Eyes also started to turn toward a man named Michael Cook, who had been a high school classmate of Kane's. In his divorce proceedings, Kane alleged that just days after Kyron's disappearance, Michael and Terry began having an affair. Not only that, he accused Terry of leaking sensitive information about the investigation to Michael. This is all apparently based on text messages and emails that he found. Basically, this whole time is a messy confluence of divorce proceedings and a missing persons investigation. At one point, Kane even accuses Terry of trying to abduct their daughter from a gym daycare. But despite this, police remain focused on finding Kyron. They continue to run down leads surrounding Terry's whereabouts that day, and ground searches continue for the little boy. In early August, a grand jury was convened and Dee Dee reportedly gave several hours of testimony in addition to Desiree Kane and Desiree's husband, Tony. But despite all of the suspicions and rumors, the grand jury found that there wasn't enough evidence to bring anyone to trial. Well, yeah, there is. I mean, at this point, there's no evidence. There's no evidence. There's no evidence of any of any wrongdoings. Yeah, just, I mean, just a, that, that relate to Kyra's bad, disappearance. Right, just yeah. a, a messy divorce where there's potential affairs. Yeah. And I say affairs plural mm-hmm. uh, to include Didi. Mm. I'm still uh, I'm still wondering where the 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 motive comes in if if this was foul play. Um, well, I think it takes a while for people to kind of come to that as well. Um, but eventually, Desiree definitely does have some opinions. As 2010 waned, searches continued, but with less manpower than before. The billboard slowly began coming down, and Terry and King continued to battle in court over custody of Kiara and their divorce. By the end of that year, Desiree even began turning against her ex-husband. During an appearance on the Today Show, Desiree said she was appearing without King because she was, quote, disappointed in the choices he's making, end quote. Kane made a lot of accusations against Terry in their divorce proceedings, including that after Kiara's birth, Terry suffered from postpartum depression and used alcohol to self-medicate. He claimed that he would often find her passed out on the couch. So Desiree told Meredith Vieira that she would not have tolerated Kyron being in that house had she known. She also claimed that she had discussed her getting custody of Kyron a year before his disappearance, but that Kane was against it. So basically, like, all this stuff's coming out in the divorce, and Desiree's pissed because she said, wait, if your house and your life was such a mess, and if this woman was such a mess, why didn't you tell me? I would have stepped in and done something. Basically, it boils down to the fact that Desiree at this point 100% believes that Terry is responsible for Kyron's disappearance, and she's blaming Kane for allowing Terry into their son's life. Right before this interview, police showed Desiree emails that Terry had sent prior to Kyron's disappearance. Regarding those emails, Desiree said, quote, She blames a lot of the marital problems between Kane and herself on Kyron. It was a huge point of contention in their marriage, and she had expressed in great detail her hatred for Kyron. I now believe, without a shadow of a doubt, that not only is she capable of hurting Kyron, that it's clear that she could have hurt him in the worst possible way. End quote. 
So at this point, there's even with those emails, unless there's a direct like I'm going to kill him, you know, police still it's all circumstantial evidence. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's still not enough. No, and, she was the mother venting about marital problems. Like that doesn't and, mean anything. And there's no body. Right. But Desiree didn't let that stop her. In 2011, she filed a civil suit against Terry, which accused Terry of kidnapping her son, and she asked the court to compel her to return him or produce his body. But she dropped the suit later that summer as she didn't want it to interfere with the ongoing criminal investigation. Right. But then in 2012, she filed suit again, citing custodial interference. Now, this one led to Dee Dee Spiker giving a deposition in which she was asked 140 questions by attorneys. She put the fifth to nearly every single question, mm. including whether or not she even knew the Horman family or had ever met Chiron. Desiree ended up dropping this suit in 2013, but remained frustrated by Terry's continued silence on Chiron's disappearance. Things didn't get much better for Terry after Desiree dropped the second suit. Even though their divorce was finalized, the custody battle over Kiara dragged on. In 2014, a judge awarded Kane full custody of their daughter and only allowed Terry visitation under strict supervision. In August of 2014, she applied to change her name to Claire Stella Sullivan, saying that she wanted to escape the stigma of the Horman name. Her request was denied basically because they didn't want her slipping away while Kyron was still missing. Right. Yeah. If she's still a, a suspect. Yeah. And she was never officially a suspect, but they wanted to be able to easily find her. Yeah. <laughs> Terry tried again, asking a different court to allow her to change her name to Claire Kiziel. She withdrew that request after a Facebook petition against it gathered over 3,000 signatures. And this doesn't surprise me because in researching this case, I came across social media posts that talk about where Terry has been seen, like recent posts, um, tracking her movements and encouraging people to get pictures of her car and, you know, share like where they see her. During her quest to get her name changed, Terry said that she had been unable to find employment for the past four years. And while she did manage to find a job as a caregiver to adults with mental illness, she left shortly after this fact became public because it had a really negative impact on her employer. This is a, a, an unfortunate circumstances of uh, social media. Mm -hmm. what, if, what if she's completely innocent? Well, exactly. And I mean, that's the thing. If you look at it from that perspective, the things that are on the line about her are terrifying. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are pictures of her car, her license plate, her home, right. you know, that people keep on sharing on Facebook and on Twitter, you know, because, and they have the express purpose of not giving her any peace. Right. Which, if she is a murderer, like, maybe you can justify that. Right. Sure. But, but, but we don't know. No. Facebook doesn't know. Right. The, the people that are doing this have you know, little to no knowledge or, or, you know, any more knowledge than what, what, what we have here. Yeah. And they're persecuting her. The only thing that, that we know of is that she, according to her ex-husband has a history of, of mental, mental illness with postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe that was untreated or undiagnosed and untreated mm -hmm. and rolled into some other form of depression, mental illness. Maybe she had mental issues, mental health issues beforehand. And it just looks really bad because all of it's coming out right around the time that this child went missing. Yeah, exactly. As years go on, Kane and Desiree try to keep Kyron's name out there in hopes of finding their son, but other than her testimony regarding her name change, Terry stays silent on her stepson's disappearance. That is until 2016 when she decides to go on Dr. Phil and tell her story. Always with the talk shows. I know. And this is a few years after Kane and Desiree appeared on the show and accused Terry of taking their son. 
Hey guys, have you heard about Anchor Podcasts? It is the easiest way to start your own podcast. In fact, it is how I created this one. So let me tell you about it. Number one, most important, it is free. Um, You can also use creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. They'll even distribute your podcast for you. So they'll make sure that you get onto Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and all these other amazing podcast platforms so that you can find listeners. You can also make money from your podcast. They have built-in monetization tools and there's no minimum listenership required. It is everything you need to make a podcast all in one place, and I can't recommend it highly enough. If you want to get started, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm today. During the interview, Dr. Phil presses Terry on why she failed two polygraphs early in the investigation. The entire clip is on our blog, but she claims that a hearing problem prevented her from processing the questions properly, leading her to her first failure. As for her second failure, this is what she has to say. Did you hear the questions? I did, but it took a minute to, to get them. What so, did he ask you? Um, uh, one of the questions was, was Kyron in the truck with you? Well, there's a fail right there because he was in the truck with me on the way to school, but not when we're leaving. So that one I can't even get right. And that was the one that I supposedly failed. He didn't ask you if you didn't ask me if, if I knew where my son didn't, where he was. He uh, did ask if I knew. Um, what do you do? You know who do you know who has him or yeah? Do you know do you know who has him or where he is? But the one that was failed was whether or not he was in the truck with me. So, yeah, she says she failed one question on the second polygraph, from what I understand. Or at least that's the only question she wants to bring up to Dr. Yeah. Phil Yeah, that she failed. Failing one question is not failing an entire polygraph test. Right. And she very clearly um, failed two polygraph tests and then walked out of a third. Why'd she walk out of the third? She was frustrated by, I guess, the way it was set up. He talks about it earlier in the clip. For her part, Desiree was disgusted with Terry's interview and told reporters that she wished Terry would talk to the police instead of Dr. Phil. While the interview did allow Terry to get her side of the story out there, finally, she also used it as an an opportunity to deny the murder for hire plot, which, you know, he obviously asked her about. And according to Terry, police pressured the landscaper and basically said, like, you're going to say, you know, what we want you to say, or we're going to deport your family. It seems a little far-fetched. Yes, it does. However, I mean, with that said, he did testify and, you know, nothing ever came of it. She was never charged with anything. And, you know, I couldn't find the exact records on it, but she said that basically his testimony fell apart on the stand, which does seem correct, given that, like I said, nothing came of it. And, you know, if they did believe that she did something to Kyron, you know, that could have been her Al Capone tax fraud. Like, they could have gotten her for that while they built a case against her for Kyron's disappearance. Yeah, all right. Uh, just see, It just seems far... Far-fetched to believe that the that early in the investigation that police would be pressuring somebody to to make false statements. You know, especially when she was never even named a suspect. Right. Yeah. It seems like a lot. She also says in another clip that I also have linked on the blog that when she came out of the house after the 911 calls and after Kane took his daughter and and left and, you know, reporters were like, hey, what's going on? Are you guys okay? She's like, oh, yeah, everything's fine. She said that the police told her to lie to the media and that's why she lied. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that appearance did not exactly start the redemption arc she was probably hoping for. Because shortly after taping, California police found her and arrested her for stealing a gun from her roommate. She was booked in the Yuba County Jail on July 4th. 
She posted bond, but then was arrested again shortly before Christmas for driving a stolen vehicle. And that charge was later dismissed due to a lack of evidence. Terry remarried in 2018 and currently lives in California. She has not spoken publicly about Kyron's disappearance since that Dr. Phil interview in 2016. I still don't see the motive. I mean, other so, other than than those emails, right? Just saying that she believed uh, that he was the the problem in their relationship. Yeah, and I mean, but that's it. From what I gather, like that's what Desiree at least thinks that the motive was was that you know Kyron was causing problems in her marriage and she wanted to get rid of them, but at the same time. If you believe the murder for hire plot, six to seven months prior to Kyron's disappearance, she was trying to get rid of her husband. Right. And what's the motive there? Right. So, I mean, my, my first instinct with that is insurance. I mean, I guess, but that never comes up. Like, that did not come up in anything that I read. And, you know, maybe there's more in, the, like, the actual divorce proceedings. But, I mean, this case is heavily covered. Yeah. And... No reporters, no news articles, nothing like ever mentioned insurance. And you know that she's not afraid of divorce. Like Terry had been married two times prior to marrying Kane. You know, like she's, she's married to her fourth husband now. Like, so it can't even be like, oh my gosh, I could never get a divorce. I'm going to kill him. I mean, well, that's don't, don't judge people on multiple divorces. Hey, I know, babe. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. And, and, we're 10 years on right now, and to this day, Terry has never been named a suspect officially by police, even though Kane and Desiree seem to believe, like I said, 100% that she did it. And it could just be that, you know, there are no other likely explanations. Um, yeah, it, and, and given that uh, her history and the, and the things that they – that they know about her, it, it could be an easy way for, for the parents, you know, to focus their anger, focus their, right. their emotions or suspicions on her. Yeah. To wrap um, their minds around this horrible tragedy. Right. When in reality, it doesn't seem that there's any solid evidence that she did anything. There isn't. And for her part, Terry does say that, you know, she stayed quiet because police told her to. I mean, she also says she lied to the media because police told her to, yeah. um, you know, I think everything that the people say in interviews to talk show hosts, I think they <laughs> salt. So, yeah. And, you know, she, but she also says that like, there was a creepy guy hanging around to seven 11 that day. And, you know, she, so she says that there were people around who basically could be alternate suspects. I mean, there's a lot more that goes into this. Um, I mean, it's, it's such a deep and winding rabbit hole of a case. What would she have done with him? I mean, presumably. So there have been searches going on since his disappearance. Now, this is not a cold case at all. This case is still extremely active and searches have been going on, you know, periodically for the past 10 years. And they have at times gone to like particular islands or, or other places nearby. Um, and it, you know, there's just a lot of outdoor space, Yeah, but you're right. I mean, the motive is the toughest part for me, Yeah, it, especially when, you know, it's kind of like what Desiree was saying where she didn't know what was going on and she would have taken Kyren and she went to custody, but Kane said no. Like, I feel that, you know, Terry at some point could have just said, hey, I think, you know, Kyron's destroying our marriage. Maybe he can go live with with Desiree or, or something. Yeah, and, and maybe that did come up. And maybe it did, but um, it just seems like there are options. Well, yeah, 
There's about a million other options. Well, other, of course. Other than kidnapping or murder. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the psychological aspect of this. I, you know, I brought up earlier to you about, uh, it's not Munchausen by proxy mm-hmm. anymore. Factitious disorder. Factitious disorder, which deals with poisoning kids. But I, I wonder if there's some type of, you know, you, you mentioned, um, about how she was constantly posting things on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And so, the, and it's worth mentioning that the day Kyron disappeared, so she went home, you know, presumably after the science fair and then went to the gym and, you know, did all this stuff, but also posted pictures of him at the science fair that afternoon. Right. I just wonder if there's some sort of psychological disorder about getting that, Attention, I, I don't know yeah. whether it's social media or otherwise. Um, no, I get what you're saying. And, I mean, I can see that. But holy shit, did that backfire for her if that <laughs> if that's what happened. I don't think this was uh, what she was looking for at all. No, but it could but it could have been the initial thought process mm-hmm. for somebody that, that has – some sort of mental health disorder that something terrible happens to her, her, her stepson who she deeply loved. And Mm -hmm. there's all of this evidence on Facebook. And then suddenly she's the, you know, partially grieving parent. Yeah. No. And and that is how it was at the beginning. Like that first week, you know, everybody, like their eyes were on them and everybody felt sorry for all of them involved. And it was just this awful thing. And she was proactive and, you know, um, like posting stuff and ordering buttons and flyers and all of these things and, and did have a lot of attention. So, I mean, maybe, I don't know, but it's, it is of course all just speculation. Yes, absolutely. All speculation. Desiree still continues to search every day for her son. In 2019, she held a news conference in which she said that investigators have narrowed the search to a hundred acre area, but didn't reveal what information had led to that determination. Kyron would be 18 years old today and would have been in the high school class of 2020. Desiree has said over the years that all of the birthdays, holidays, and other milestones are, of course, heartbreaking. Of the graduation, she says, quote, The fact that I don't get to be a part of that, it makes me angry. Someone took that away from us, and it's not right. End quote. In her heart, Desiree Young believes that person is her old friend, Terry. Richard Horman has been missing from Portland, Oregon since June 4th, 2010. No suspect has ever been named in his disappearance. The Multnomah County Sheriff's Office is still actively investigating this case. If you have any information on what happened to Kyron, please call the MCSO tip line at 503-988-0560. You can see all the sources for this episode in our show notes and on our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!